Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done <clears throat> about 525 of them or 530 or something by now. And if that this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the, of the site. Um, my guest today is Susan Raven. Susan is a longtime student of anthroposophy. Is that the pr- right pronunciation, Susan? Yep, that's great. Well wow. done. <laughs> <laughs> well done. And um, an experienced <laughs> workshop facilitator. She has worked with the methods and exercises prescribed by Rudolf Steiner for seeing into the supersensible realms and has also trained with Dorian Schmidt, director of the Biodynamic Research Institute. Susan is author of the book Nature Spirits, Remembrance, A Guide to the Elemental Kingdom, featured in the Cyrus Mag- Cygnus magazine, Nexus, Star and Furrow, and Catechus. Susan is also a singer-songwriter and has produced two CDs entitled Glittering Cities and Raven Song, which are regularly played on local and regional radio stations, including the BBC. Um, Sometime during this interview, we'll play her song Glittering Cities, so insert it into the interview. Susan lives in Wales. And um, so I've really enjoyed reading her book during the past week. Um, It's filled in some gaps in my understanding, I would say. And uh, I think that there will be a lot in this interview which will be new to BatGap, but um, very important. I'm really glad we're getting the opportunity to cover it. So thanks, Susan, for doing this. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. Oh, you're welcome. Um, By way of a little bit more introduction, let me just say that... um, you know, people who have listening, been listening to this show regularly have many times heard me allude to the idea that uh, there's a, a sort of a field of intelligence or fe- we could say field of consciousness, but it's not merely consciousness, it's intelligent underlying and permeating all of creation. And that there are impulses within that field, which we might call laws of nature. And these impulses um, are responsible for the the, or, the manifestation and orchest- orchestration of the material universe or the apparent material universe. And, um, but I don't think we've ever really gone into in any great detail on, you know, what these impulses are or if, if they are impulses of intelligence, whether they sort of are, are conscious entities or what they are. And I, th- I think this is interesting because in my understanding or in my, in my opinion, um, spiritual awakening includes not only awakening to one's essential nature, the self, uh, and maybe it's icing on the cake, but it would be nice if it also included um, a, uh, an experiential and intellectual understanding of mechanics of nature, how the world works. Um, and I think that this experience and understanding could have tremendous implications for the world in which we now live and the problems it faces, particularly environmental problems. So um, we're going to cover that and a whole lot of other topics during this interview. Um, But I think maybe I would like to let Susan do her own introduction here and kind of lay out the the groundwork of, of what, how she came to this work, what it is and what we would like to cover today. So go ahead, Susan. Okay, well, I came to this work when I moved out of London and I moved into the Welsh Highlands and Uplands. And, excuse me, and it was this living life force, this quality of the landscape that really spoke to me. And I had found my way to anthroposophy, which is the philosophy of Rudolf Steiner. And for those of you who do not know who Rudolf Steiner was. He was a great seer, a great scientist, and he's best known for uh, starting the Waldorf schools and Steiner education. Oh, the Waldorf he, schools. I didn't know that. That's There's one yeah. of those in my town here. 
Right. Little town well, of 10,000 people. We have a Waldorf school. Okay. Well, that's what he's most famous for. But he was born with a great faculty of being able to see into what I'm going to be calling the super sensible realm. And uh, he then gave many, many lectures over his life. And he gave a lot of lectures on the structure of the spiritual world. And I'm going to call this the super sensible world. And by that, I'm going to be calling it the etheric life forces within uh, the manifest and unmanifest world and what I call the astral world. So the etheric is all about color, gesture, streaming, movement and the shaping forces just beyond our visible reality. And then the astral realm is more about beings, inspiration, that feeling of being watched, uh, speech, being space, vast space. So when I speak about the super sensible realm, I'm incorporating both, both of those streams, the etheric and the astral. May I interject something here? Mm -hmm. um, perhaps it would be useful to just say that there to think of creation as as having sort of a, a range or strata from gross to subtle to transcendent, like we like an ocean has surface level of waves, de depth of the water, and then some, you know, ocean floor. Um, and so ordinarily, you know, people's perception is is limited to the the area of the waves, and they don't. Uh, yeah. They're not scuba divers. They don't explore the deeper realms of the ocean. Um, so using that metaphor, ordinarily our, our attention is held by the concrete material gross surface level of perception. But there is a vast range of subtler perception that's possible for a human being to access. And if they do, they begin to discover all sorts of things that have been there all along, but that they and most people were totally unaware of. Yes, it's a step-down process. You can maybe condense it down to consciousness, process, form. And the whole universe is a life form. It thinks, it imagines, and it creates. And there's a whole choir of intelligences, beings that implement these grand and great imaginations and these great grand ideas. And around us are the preserved imaginations of the gods. And so I see the elemental kingdom and the nature spirits as a way of really understanding oneness because this extraordinary enigmatic word, oneness, well, how are we all one? And so I see the elementals as this connective tissue. So there are the elementals of in my bones, in my blood, in my skin, to air, to aura, to tree, to sap, to trunk. So it's this whole connective tissue of beings that are upholding the imaginations and the ideas of the creator. And what, what were those three words you said to, from something to process, consciousness to process, to form? Is form. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. The, there's actually Sanskrit words corresponding to that. It's Rishi, Devata, right. and Chandas. Um, that, so they, they understood this in that tradition. Yeah. So, and then, so with that in mind, you matter doesn't create form. It fills the spaces outlined by invisible forces. Say that again. Matter doesn't create form. It fills it the spaces. It fills the space created and outlined by subtle beings and forces. Hmm. So then you would say that all matter, this book, for instance, um, mm -hmm. explain it in terms of this book as an example. Right. Or you could, or with a plant. A plant. So, okay, yeah. 
yes, or with a plant or a book, is that um, you have the ideal of the plant. This is the original ideal of the higher hierarchies. And this is raining down on the earth. And you have elementals, for instance, around the space of a plant. You have the seed in the earth and you have elementals around the earth. And as that seed comes up, it fills the spaces of the prototype and of the idea of the plant. Hmm. So to put it in other words, you could say perhaps that the plant has a subtle body, which is not material, and that that subtle body exists whether or not the material plant has come into existence, but the material plant comes into existence in correlation with the, the subtle body of the plant. Would that be correct? Yes, and that subtle body is a mixture of streaming. It's streaming, it's color. When you begin to uh, develop this process of actually seeing into the etheric field, which is this field of subtle color, movement, streaming, you begin to see, as you say, this ideal form of the plant, this subtle form of the plant that the form then goes in to fill. Mm. Wasn't it Plato who talked about ideal forms? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Huh. And uh, <clears throat> and so with a book, I mean, it's being held in its integrity by gravity. And so we would be talking about the earth elementals. They are the ones that look after gravity. And so, I mean, I can go into the um, four different elements and the um, elementals that are aligned to it. Would you like me to do that? Um, Shall I do that? Let's unfold it a little bit more, but we'll, we'll, definitely, bit more. we'll definitely get into that. I mean, I'm thinking now of, um, you know, what science would say about this book, which is that as you go into the microscopic, it becomes less and less a material thing and more and more empty space. And that anything which appears to be material is just some kind of probability wave or something yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that yeah. there's, there's really nothing substantial. It's all just probabilities and and something somehow congealing into something that appears physical. And I think that that probably correlates with what you're saying about the elementals and all. Yes, they're sort of hovering between the enfolded and the unfolded, the implicit and the explicit. They're on that cutting edge. They are the last reverberation of the cosmic creative word that underlies all existence. They are that last vibration before things drop down from the wave to the particle. So they're like middlemen, in a way, between yes. the unmanifest and the manifest. And, yeah. 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 And as such, they play a role in connecting the two or bringing, you know, things into manifestation and then you know, conducting their existence once they are manifest, I would presume. Yes, it's it's like the architect and the there's the architect, there's the project manager, and then there's the workers, and they're they're the sort of the last reverberation. They're the one holding the integrity of form. Actually, that leads to a question that I had in the back of my mind: the architect, the project manager, and the workers. In much of your book, when you talk about the elementals, they sound to be to me to be rather microscopic, uh, or at least very small, like there might be elementals around a bird or a single flower or a bee or something like that. Um, but it would also seem to me that as we go to larger and larger structures, they would have their corresponding intelligence or deva or something that oversees them, like, you know, the, the entire earth or the entire galaxy or Absolutely. You know, that kind of thing. There must be hierarchies of larger and more powerful or more influential beings that correspond to every size of structure in creation. Yes. Now, when I speak about the size of elementals, I always stop and I say, may I have permission to speak about your size? Because we as humans love to 
fit everything into a concept. We like concepts that fit, which we have to soften them. We have to soften that demand to have things fit a shape and a size. Because in, in some ways, it's almost bad manners in this realm to be demanding to know what a shape and the size of an elemental or a nature spirit is. You're going into this highly conductive, highly sensitive realm of extreme intelligence and extreme feeling. So with permission to say what size they are, they are many sizes and they can change size. But as you're right, there are the smaller ones that are holding this integrity. And then there are the larger ones. You can have a nature spirit. It's between an elemental and a nature spirit. And I would say an elemental are the smaller ones. The nature spirits are bigger. They are overseeing a community of elementals. So, for instance, a tree spirit or a nature spirit of a tree would be overseeing the elementals of the undines of the sap, the liquid, the gnomes of the roots and the bark. They would be overseeing the sylphs who are the light bearers and the salamanders or fire spirits who are taking care of the generative warmth that ripens the fruit and creates the seeds. So you'd have an overarching intelligence. And also you'd then have the bigger, if you like, or those who oversee a larger space. For instance, <clears throat> there's what, what we would call the genus loci or spirit of place. Now each area has this genus loci or overarching spirit of place that is overseeing the elementals and nature spirits of a particular area. And for on my path, this has been a really important relationship with the genus loci. It is through the genus loci <clears throat> that I've been allowed to enter the mysteries further and further into the um, intelligence of the land and its elementals. So are you saying that that kind of corresponds a little bit to human geography, that Wales has a genus loci and, and Scotland has one and, yes. you know, South Africa and diff different places? And, um, folk spirits, they're called folk spirits. Yeah. If, you're, if you're talking about a, a large country, one would call it a folk spirit. A genus loci is more like a, again, you're making me, <laughs> You're forcing me into giving weights and measures and numbers. Hold it lightly. Yeah. It's it's a breathing, moving, living thing. It sure. They, they don't fight they don't fight over boundaries like the no. Israelis and Palestinians <laughs> or something. No. <laughs> no. Um so for instance, the genus loci that I'm in constant contact with, I would say, is about a two to three mile radius. It's over, overlooking my particular area that I live in. <clears throat> One thing you notice as you travel from country to country is that there's often, and even sometimes from town to town, is that there's quite a different feeling, even, even sometimes when you cross a border. So do, do the, whatever the in impulse of intelligence would be that corresponds to the collective consciousness of a particular town or country, um, do they somehow organize themselves to, um, to focus their jurisdiction on jurisdictions that humans themselves have somewhat arbitrarily formed over the years? Yes. I mean, social activity calls in a new being. A new being appears with a social activity. For instance, it can be a physical so social activity of a gathering of people in a village or a town. It can also be an initiative. For instance, the initiative of Buddha at the gas pump. A few days ago, I said, with warmth and respect, may I meet 
the being of Buddha at the gas pump. Huh. And there is a strong and light-filled and gracious being that is well and truly formed from your years of work of interview. Interesting. And yeah. Huh. Is and it the kind of thing immediate. where um, if you had like a rock concert or something, a, a being forms around the collective consciousness of that group that has assembled? Yes, and then it can disperse, but something which is ongoing, for instance, of your initiative or something like anthroposophy, right. or <clears throat> it's, it's a very well-established being. Hmm. Interesting. Another question that I wanted to ask you a few minutes ago that I don't want to lose is, um, you know, you were talking about a tree, for instance, and how the different uh, elementals, which we'll get into in a few minutes, um, um, are responsible for different aspects of its functioning. Um, are there also, and this would somehow relate to things Rupert Sheldrake says, um, would there be some kind of either elemental or some sort of impulse of consciousness that would correspond to an entire species of trees or let's say an entire species of birds, say geese, there's geese worldwide have a certain deva Absolutely. that is corresponding to them. Yes, it is, or the being that, um, who brought forth the idea of the goose hmm. it is the archetype of the goose right. or the archetype and these well, again we we'll go back to plato and his edos his ideas these are the great beings who are overseeing the becomings huh. there was an interesting article i came across a while back and i actually sent this to rupert um, Sheldrake, um, where some species of bird or something which had completely gone extinct in some Indian Ocean island or someplace actually came back into existence. And it was, it was clear that it couldn't have come in from any sort of hidden birds that had been forgotten about. I mean, it was really extinct. But this thing was, again, began to be found. And Rupert found that fascinating. He thought it sort of validated the concept of there being yes. a, a collective consciousness or whatever of that species that yeah i think i think many of the um you could say like the angels of a particular species or the um the archetypal the being who gave of the archetype of a particular animal they've pulled them out of the physical world but they're ready in the etheric and astral to come back in again huh yeah interesting so theoretically, dodo birds, dinosaurs, all kinds of species, which may or may not ever come back, we wouldn't necessarily want them to, there's still the um, template of those on some level. Yes, and also their becoming, their, their potential of becoming. Right, right. Um, I, wouldn't, I would say they're just out of the physical world and into this life force world, which is the, the etheric world and astral world. They're just, they're pulled back because it's, you know, the conditions here are so appalling in certain places of where they used to live. I, f I feel that is very much a truth that they will come back. But what comes back has to align with what our karma is and conditions on earth. And Yeah, right. I mean, okay, good. We got that point. All right. So a few minutes ago, you wanted to start getting into some details and... Uh... <laughs> Irene just wrote me a note. She said, the dodo birds have taken human form. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Good. Good one. <laughs> okay, so you wanted to get into some details about different types of elementals, I believe, and I kind of postponed you a bit. So we can start to get into that now. Right. Okay. Um, well, I think, first of all, I'm going to give you... Um, I'm going to run through actually what an elemental is. And this came to me over a, quite a while because the impulse to write this book was to really make the whole process of understanding the elementals and the nature spirit a much easier process for people to come to. And also those who actually believe in elementals and nature spirits, they need to find a vocabulary that helps them into this world. Yes, so I'm just and since you said the word belief, I just want to throw in that um, everything we're talking about here is really not something to be believed in or disbelieved in. Take it as a hypothesis. You know, take it as something that potentially you could, ex 
empirically or experientially explore, you know, given the right unfoldment of your capacities. And, you know, you can be as skeptical as you like, but if you possibly were to do X, Y, and Z over a period of time, you would begin to acquire the ability to experience the things we're talking about if, in fact, they truly exist. Yeah. I mean, there is, <laughs> there are so many people who have been torn, David Spangler, Whom I've interviewed. These, yeah, who's uh. very highly skilled seer. There's I feel it is an, a consequence of a path, of taking your path of enlightenment. It is a consequence. You will come to see these beings. You will come, even if it's not seeing them, communicating and feeling with them and having a knowingness about their existence is a consequence, is a consequence yes. of it. And also influencing them and being influenced by them. Um, there's a verse in the Gita which says something about how you support the gods and they support you. There's this reciprocal kind of um, relationship that develops. Absolutely. It's, it's this plura plurality of nature spirits and elementals that are, that are longing and aching for uh, a co-creative relationship with human beings. Mm -hmm. Because for years and years we've been we've been weighing, we've been measuring, we've been thinking about explaining and philosophizing and talking about stuff. It's now time to talk to stuff. <laughs> yeah. And it's because there is profound truth when you can find this thread of pure attentiveness from your heart or from your body and sending it into the phenomena of nature. And along this thread of attentiveness, if you're quiet and still enough and you have enough love and respect and gratitude, you will begin to get the wisdom of nature in its purest form. And it won't just come in words. It comes in a whole range of uh, feelings, symbols, because the nature spirits, they read us, not the words, it's the feelings that coat the words. Mm. So there's this whole palette of feeling. And then one mixes this all together with symbols. And I don't like to use the word download. A lot of people use the word download. I prefer to say a gift of advanced comprehension which brings feeling, symbology, and words, and messaging as well. And we are so starved of truth. There are so many lies spinning around the planet, and this is having a really detrimental effect on the etheric field of the Earth and the astral field of, of the Earth. And there is a deep and profound hunger in people to know the truth. When you begin to open up and build these capacities of communication with nature, you receive pure truth. Mm. And one gets a kind of truth in a language that you don't use between human and human. And this, if anything, should be or needs to be an impulse why we go into this world is to gather truth, a kind of truth that comes from nature herself. So it is learning this new vocabulary which uses the whole body as an instrument as a, of diagnosis. Yeah. I mean, there are many, of course, we have some highly um, sophisticated sensors that can pick up all sorts of things. But they don't really pick up the elementals yet. Oh, you mean because the you mean man-made technical sensors? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure, like X-ray machines or whatever. Right. Yeah, De detectors and, I mean, of different types. We we take something like biophotons. They're so close to what, for instance, Rudolf Steiner would describe the sylphs, but they're not the same thing. You can't say they're the same thing. We as human beings are advanced enough with our organs of perception and our capacities for seeing into these subtle realms are awoken 
and nurtured. We can then begin to go into this realm and access pure truth. And this is what we are so hungry for at the moment. I love this point. Um, and uh, it's one that I've thought about a lot over the years. If, if you think about it, the, the human nervous system, even a single cell in the human nervous system, is more complex than any instrument that mankind has been able to build. It's more complex than the Large Hadron Collider. <clears throat> now, obviously, instruments like that and microscopes and telescopes and so on, they, they serve particular functions that the human nervous system and body wasn't, weren't, weren't designed to perform. Um, but the, this instrument, the human nervous system, has capabilities that man-made instruments will never be able to perform. And you've just been getting at that, really. Um, and I was engaged in some conversation with somebody on Facebook a while ago, and he was saying, how do you know that all this stuff that we talk about with spirituality and all the different things is not just some kind of function of brain chemistry that's, that's imaginary and as gratifying as it may be, has no correlation with reality. And I was a little bit hard pressed to answer him, but I, I think you helped to do that just now, which is that we, if, the, if this instrument is properly refined and attuned, it actually can know truth. It can tune into a level of, of nature which is real and true and know it with, with greater certainty than ordinarily we can know anything. Um, okay, and there's ways of verifying this. The more you do this work, and it's opening up the imagination to accommodate these realities, and just you have to almost neutralize knowledge. You have to go into a place of complete no bias, unbiased, right. neutralize this knowledge, and you have to clear this stage within your inner life to allow what these beings wish to convey to us. Now, our ancient ancestors were highly um, tuned into nature, and they were working with the elementals and the nature spirits, and we lost that capacity in our um in the cycles of evolution in order to uh, develop the intellect. And now it's time to use this highly, um, highly sophisticated intellect we have and shoot it through with um, feeling, sensing. Uh, use this intellect alongside um, our ability, our ability to be an empath, to have empathy. Yeah. So when one begins to get a message or symbology or answers when one sends out questions to the elementals, you begin to develop the capacity to know what is fantasy, what is truth, what is imagination. And when you are being... Um, influenced in a impure way because not all elementals are not the not all nature spirits and elementals are working for um what i would call heavenly ruling will yeah we we'll get into been, that with you also yeah mm, it they're, they're working with um impure human will so how do you know so I'm going to anticipate a question. How do you know that what you're receiving is the truth? If you get images, if you stop in your imagination and you start trying to pull them into something else and they keep snapping back, that's one way. Another way, well, either if you're out in nature or you're doing some research, and you receive an imagination and it gives you an energy, you feel a real sweetness from it. It has a giving quality, something that is impure and that is um, illusion is taking from you. You might feel drained or something. Yeah, it's taking from you. And also if you have a being that comes into your inner screen with a message, who am I working with? That's the first question. 
who am I working with? This is if you're unsure. Yeah. Who am I working with? What's your mood? They don't like to be followed with that question. <laughs> what is your mood? Huh. And so these are sort of three immediate things I would use to find out, is this authentic and is this real? And after a while, if you've been doing it long enough, you, you know. And also it's, it's working when I say working, exploring, there's the solitary path. And a lot of my life is a solitary path, walking these uplands and communicating with the nature spirits. And, you know, I've had many profound experiences that break the heart and also inspire song. But I think what's really key is when groups of people come together who are developing these capacities and we set about an experimentation and an investigation like looking into tree disease or animal disease and communicate, communicating with the being of the disease itself because there is a being of a disease and it's summoning this being and, and speaking with it. And then when you have, let's say, 10, 12, 20 people all doing the same work and we all come in with <clears throat> very sim similar symbols, messages, feelings, sensing, then the skeptic has to take this seriously. Yeah, that's the scientific method, rep replication, yeah. right? It, it's replication, but it's like, is this real? Do I believe in it? Does it correlate with others? And is it repeatable? Those, those are the main scientific um, mandates. But you have to be very careful with this. Is it repeatable? Yeah. Bad manners. Why did you ask me twice? I've given you the answer. They don't know. They don't understand why we do triple blind twist testing. <laughs> Yeah. Why have you asked me? You're dealing with beings that are, they're not human beings. It's you, you're dealing with something that's highly conductive, highly sensitive, and they don't live by our rules. And therefore, that's why we have to neutralize knowledge. I mean, when I go, when we go into an experimentation of, let's say, looking into a plant disease or a, a an animal disease, I don't research it beforehand. I go in completely neutralizing the knowledge, begin to get images and messages in, and then I do the research afterwards to sort of to, to work out what, you know, the material I've received. Mm. The thing you said about repeating reminds me of a story I heard the other day where somebody did a DMT trip and this being came to him and said, this is not the way, don't do it this way. And then a, a few weeks later, he, he did another DMT DT trip and the same being came to him and said, hey, I told you not to do it this way. <laughs> um, a, a question came in, let me just pop this in here before we go on. This is from Carol. She wants to know, do we know what she means that they oversee the elementals? What does oversee mean? Okay, so I would say that a nature spirit is, is an organizing intelligence. It's receiving the prototype or the ideal form from the higher hierarchies. And it's, let's say, for instance, <clears throat> you have a nature spirit of a rock. It holds the memory of the evolution of that particular area. It's overseeing the setting of limits to matter. It is, and by that word overseeing, it is um, holding the wisdom of the phenomena. Okay, hopefully that answers Carol's question. Um, I have another question for you. Shall I ask it or do you want to say something more right now? 
if ask if there's more she wants to know from that. Okay, another question from me. You were talking about how the the time has come when we've I forget how you said it, but if we if we look at historically how you know there were apparently ancient cultures that had a lot of wisdom and then we got into the middle ages and we got into the sort of the the inquisition and very fundamentalist religious attitudes mm-hmm. and all sorts of bizarre ideas about the truth um which men, <laughs> many of which uh, still exist in in certain circles <laughs> um and then the scientific revolution came about and, and you know scientists the people who initiated that said wait a minute you know we're going to just somehow do this more objectively and systematically we're going to try to exclude subjectivity because it's so sub it's so vulnerable to delusion and yeah. and try to sort of figure out what's actually going on in the world and to a great extent this has worked um you know all the technologies and and that we see in the world today are as an outcome of of that initiative uh but underlying that initiative um Descartes uh and being largely responsible um is the the notion that the world is inanimate it's dumb stuff it's it, it's 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 just matter and we and springing from that assumption is the the feeling that we can do whatever we want with it you know extract whatever resources and you know dig up the earth here and burn down this thing there and and so on um and that has brought us literally to the brink of extinction in my opinion uh or if not extinction then tremendous catastrophe um so what you were saying a few minutes ago is interesting because you're what you're saying is that there is now a new stream entering collective consciousness or human mentality which hopefully will remedy uh this uh imbalanced situation that we find ourselves in so let's talk about that a little bit i'm sure you can take it from here yes well i was first of all i'll talk about our way of looking it is the way of looking which came with the whole impulse of science or through from the renaissance and through the victorian times we really don't know the power of the human gaze we really don't know how powerful that is and we've been taught a way of looking at things and as you've pointed out we've been taught a way of looking at earth's beauty and grace as mere resource and that way of looking has been taught over generations and therefore it's kind of condensed it has had an effect on nature it's pushed and expelled the beings from nature so that they're actually sort of in this kind of limbo because we haven't acknowledged them and our way of looking we stamp nature with a kind of form with our way of looking so when we begin to look in a different way and we begin to accommodate the idea that it is a living intelligence these beings will then actually be able to come back into nature and we will be able to perceive them sense them and feel them much more hmm. that's interesting So in other words if we if we regard nature as dumb stuff that you know it has no sentience no no in, innate intelligence then it almost we almost create that reality we exactly it dies yeah we put the intelligence into remission or into yes. into sub, submission and um and then we create our that reality for ourselves absolutely so we need this new way of looking that's that's you know part of the way is developing our capacities developing a new way of looking that allows these beings to thrive mm. and what was the what was the rest of the question you asked okay well remember. i'll ask you some more that'll help out <laughs> uh, so we were talking a little bit before we started the interview uh, just on you know you and i together about um the environmental situation and how okay. you know there's a there's a group here called these days called extinction rebellion and there are mm-hmm. a number of you know and they're not just kind of crazy teenagers there there's a number of very serious well credentialed climatologists 
who feel that mm -hmm. we've we've brought our species and many other species along with us to the brink of extinction. And um, if you look at the data, it's a little hard to argue with them, at least to argue with the possibility that they may be right. Um, and I've often said on this show that I, you know, I acknowledge that and it's a grave concern, but I feel that somehow this spiritual awakening that seems to be happening around the world is not coincidental. It's, it's kind of nature's response to the mess we've made and yeah. that in ways I don't thoroughly understand, it may save the day. Uh, and I think perhaps you can elaborate on that with reference to the elementals and the, the, elemental. the, the impulses okay. of intelligence, which orchestrate our world. Okay. Well, Rudolf Steiner said that at this particular point in time, the uh, beginning of the 21st century, there would be a new entrance of some new elementals. He called them the Christ elementals. In, and that these elementals would permeate science, they would, um, there would be a chemistry um, permeated by a Christ impulse, there would be a physics, there would be social activity that would be permeated by the Christ impulse. Now, those are his words. We can see this everywhere with it, the ascension, um, the idea that we are ascending whether you call it the, the Christ or the mercy of Allah or the Anun, whatever it is, whatever path it is, we are being permeated by new elementals. And you can see this in the scientific uh, work coming from Paul Violetta, for instance, with the super waves that are coming into the earth, these massive outbreaths. And you can also see it in ancient prophecy. I mean, David Wilcock has done great work with his Ascension Mysteries book about bringing in how so many of the ancient prophecies would speak of this time and that there would be this huge fire from the sun or there would be this solar cleansing where the righteous would be lifted and the evil would be burned. I mean, but essentially... This correlates with Rudolf Steyer saying we would have this new outbreath of elementals and nature spirits that would bring a new way and would support nature in this dilemma because the earth is groaning for us to wake up. Mm. And <clears throat> so that, 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 there's that term, terminology, the new elementals coming in. You do say something, I think, in your book, uh, and I've mm -hmm. read it elsewhere, that there's um, a uh, phenomenon associated with the precession of the equinoxes in which a vast uh, stream of subtle energy is supposed to, to hit us from the center of the galaxy or some such thing, mm -hmm. and that's supposed to have a profound uh, transformative and enlivening effect on us all. Yes, and that was part of the su the superwave, and I, I interpret that with the hierarch higher hierarchies, an outbreath from them, and these new elementals that are coming to help nature at the moment, and also in again in anthroposophy, Rudolf Steiner speaks about the angels coming closer and closer to us at the moment, mm. and how we are being met. By our efforts, our efforts to reconnect with nature, um, our efforts in morality, and our efforts to ascend, all the effort that we make is going to be met with angelic um, response, at moment, even more so than before. Hmm. I pulled a few quotes from... Your book, um, here's something from page 151. First, you quote Eckhart Tolle as saying, humanity is faced with a stark choice, evolve or die. And then you go on to say, at some point in the millennia to come, the drawbridge between the upward and downward path will be pulled up. Those who have con consistently served the gods of unremitting materialism will lose their chance to evolve into the next stage of human evolution. A new species of human is emerging, and the old ways will no longer serve us. 
the new path of service is one where we serve the greater whole. And those who cannot bear the light of the new consciousness will incarnate elsewhere. Humanity as a species will begin to split. Um, so there's that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and just an addendum to that question. Um, I'm wondering how, you know, you're talking about the angels moving closer to the earth and uh, this higher consciousness coming in and, and all the elementals getting enlivened. I'm wondering how that will actually play out in terms of, if you can say, in terms of things on the concrete level that, that need to change, institutions, systems, and so on that have no place in a more enlightened world uh, and practices the burning of fossil fuels i mean are, you know are, are people just going to wake up one day and say oh this was wrong let's change it uh or are they going to be kind of be forced to change it because well i just read a book called this changes everything by naomi klein it's basically capitalism versus the climate is the subtitle it, and she's saying if we don't change it voluntarily we're going to be forced to change it because the situation as it exists is so completely untenable that it's going to just it's going to shoot itself in the foot and cause its own destruction. Absolutely. I mean, I'm going to bring in a blackboard drawing by Rudolf Steiner. Sure. Can you see this? Yes, hold it up close. We see it. It looks good. I think this is for good for people to see. Now, that is a blackboard drawing of his. And in that drawing, he says that at this time, there'll be a splitting the splitting of humanity, and that our angels will have to go with us, whatever we choose. And there will be this upward path of um, evolution and then the downward path into materialism. But I think everyone will evolve. It's just at different paces of time. And how easy it's going to be is going to be how many of us begin to, as I say, connect with the earth and speak to her as a living being and speak to her legions of nature spirits and elementals and work with her because she knows exactly how to get through this and we can learn from her. As I said, we can think and explain and philosophize about things, but you can't get to the essence that way. You have to use different capacities. And it has been so mind dominated for so long that we need to be using heart capacities. We need to be using all our chakras, as I say, is these um, sensors. And we need to be speaking to the earth and all her ecosystems to get the, re the resolutions and the solutions to get us out of this difficulty. Yeah. And it's possible. It's very possible. Hmm. One thing I would add is that um, the key to doing what you just said, I think, is to get in touch with the self, capital S self, you know, <laughs> pure consciousness, oh, yes. to, to get to the very root of our being. And then once we have located that and learned to operate from there, we can get to the core or the essence of the, the world at, at large. Oh, yes, we, we need to be working on ourselves in order that we can tune ourselves to the bandwidth. Mm -hmm. And we are is looking at our morality, our diet, everything to, as I say, to make this um, <clears throat> instrument of diagnosis as effective as possible. Uh, the main uh, path for seership, the R Rudolf Steiner provides and the one that I've gone on is the path, the six steps of path of um, self-development. And I'll just quickly go through those. This is objectivity of thinking. So most of our thinking is just swinging around. It's very difficult to really control our thinking. So there's exercises of taking an object, holding it and thinking of nothing but that object, let's say a match, for instance, for five minutes. You don't let any thought go off the match. The entire history, it's one logical thought after the other for five minutes. And this creates a sort of clearance around the head because usually the head, there's this 
intense weaving light around the head in our thinking. And we need to just get this light to be as calm and as poised as possible. And that's just holding this object. Once it was a tree, it was a seed, it was a tree, it was cut down. You go through the whole history of this match until it's lit for five minutes. And I says it brings this clearance in the head. The second one Also, is, you're, fo- you're focused, obviously. I mean, it kind of reminds mm. me of the difference between ordinary light and laser light. Laser light is, mm-hmm. is, is photons, just like ordinary light is, but it's coherent photons. It's photons which yeah. have gone into synchrony, synchronicity with one another. So you're working on, and it's this clearance that I'm, that's the most important thing. Your room of thinking becomes clear and poised. Then the second one is about exercising your memory. I will do something at 11 o'clock. I will touch my ear and I will do, I make this meeting with myself and I will endeavor to keep that meeting. And you get at 11 o'clock. I've touched my ear. I've done what I've said I was going to do. I've remembered. I've stretched my memory. Do you set a reminder or you you just actually no, you no, have, no, you no, have you, to remember to check the time? No, it's it when you start, you forget. And of course, everybody goes, Oh, I'm hopeless, I can't do it, which is you can't allow yourself to indulge yourself with that. I start off by saying, tomorrow I will touch my ear at some point, and then I come down into meeting it at a particular time. And again, something happens, and this little subtle shift in the soul happens when you begin to do this. And then the next thing is control of feeling. And these are exercises where you, you summon joy, for instance. You think about something that has brought you great joy, you summon the memories, you drop the memory, and you then experience and focus on pure feeling. What is joy doing with me now? And you're sensing these great clouds of feeling around the chest. And you sit in it, and it's like pilot waves, just experiencing pure feeling. Because we don't, we so rarely, it always has thoughts and memories with it. It's learning the craft of pure feeling. And then you try something like sorrow and just see how it affects your body. And sorrow is a real gravity driven. It can pull you right down. So that when you're actually out in nature, you will get feeling pulses. And when you're exercising your feelings through all these extremes, you then begin to have a whole palette of different feelings that you can then receive from nature. And then the fourth one is seek truth, beauty and goodness. And that's, you know, the positivity, whatever's happening to you, what am I learning here? You know, what's the gift? What's what's the miracle? in this dilemma or this calamity I'm in, you know, that's a lot of spiritual parts have that. It's always seeking the positivity. And then there is the fifth one is open-mindedness, impartiality, taking all sides. And I know that that's definitely an ethos for Buddha at the gas pump. I mean, on your home page, it's about... It has to be. Let's take all sides. Walk in the other person's shoes. Yeah. And the, I mean, my point on ju- that is that if, mm. if you really want to, if, if you're interested in enlightenment, then what is it? It's, it's actually becoming the totality. And what does the totality mm-hmm. do? It actually incorporates all diversities, howsoever divergent mm-hmm. and, and contrasting or paradoxical they may be. Yes. And, and it's really entering them. And, you know, if you've, if you've had a, an argument, maybe that person was right. I'm going to just stand in their shoes and be them and look at me, you know. I mean, there's a, a German, one, German word, unbefangenheit. And when you speak these words, 
they appear on the inner screen as colors and forms. So you begin to see words as forms. And again, this is the language and the vocabulary of the nature spirits. And then the sixth, which is quite advanced, it's, it's just um, collating all of these and finding out what the next question is going to be once you've accommodated all these um, six steps to self-development. But after a while, you've actually then tuned yourself into this hopefully moral, joyful, um, unbiased human being with an open mind, ready to have a, a loving interaction with nature and her, her intelligence and her beings. Yeah, I would say it's a lifelong process. It's not like mm. you've ever done it to the extent that it could possibly be done. There's, it's like education. Are you? Mm. Some, someone might say, "Well, I'm educated. I'm completely educated." How ridiculous does that <laughs> sound? You know, <laughs> can't learn anything yeah. more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. I love those. But especially the feeling. That's the. That, I mean, we do hours and hours of this work of word meditation, for instance. And also, it's, it's working with time. I mean, we, we would meditate. I mean, for instance, when you next do your two hours meditation or you're going, work with these words, having time. Having time. And just have a real experience of what time actually looks like, how it manifests itself in color and form. Shall I give you an example of an interaction with a genus loci and what can actually come from building up a relationship sure. in that way? Yes, please. And uh, I thought of a question during our little break, and I will ask okay. it. But, but you go ahead and say your thing first, and I'll just bring my question in when it's relevant. Okay, so the genus loci, it is the spirit of a place and each of us, we all live in a location. There will be a spirit of place wherever you live, whether it's a city or it's the uplands, it doesn't matter where, there will be this spirit of place. <clears throat> and asking to have a meeting with this being, genus loci, I respectfully ask to have a meeting with you. So you send out this question. So when I arrived in this particular area, that was my question, genus loci, I respectfully ask for a meeting. And almost every day I am in a prayerful conversation or interaction with this genus loci. So why do I do it? One, because I'm constantly giving thanks for the beauty that is around me. We have this beautiful water coming up from our own spring. We have this amazing landscape. So, I mean, in this state of gratitude. And then it's, what can I do for you, genus loci? And you don't immediately get an answer. But then after a while, for instance, I would go out for a walk and I'd feel an enormous pressure to go to a particular place. And this is one example, enormous pressure to go down the hill to a particular place. Why am I being taken here? Why are you guiding me here? What is this incredible pressure I am feeling from you to go to this particular place? So when I arrived and I felt this being say stop, and then I looked down into a little dell, and there were bags and bags of dead lambs. That lambs? Had been thrown, baby yeah. sheep? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. thrown, thrown by rogue farmers because they did, not want to have the, they did not want to pay the money to have them taken away. So they'd piled them all into these bags and thrown them into this dell. Also... The um, British Telecom man had been working on some of the cables 
and they just left lots and lots of bits of cut cable and they'd thrown it down into this dell. Huh. A dell People is like had, a little ravine, I suppose. A little ravine, yes. Okay. And you'd never have seen that if you'd driven by. You wouldn't have seen it if you'd walked by. But here was this deeply wounded, polluted place that um, was causing immense stress in the nature realms, both physically and in the super sensible spiritual realm as well. So with my interaction, I was then put to work. So when we're sort of thinking, well, what can we do? How, I mean, what can I actually do? If you connect with your genus loci, after a while you are directed what you can do to be of use and to be of service. Um, all right, so... Obviously, there are messes like that around the world that are not hidden. Um, you know, we have the Alberta tar sands being dug up. We have there are copper mines in Mexico that are 100 square kilometers. There's the Amazon mm -hmm. burning, Australia burning. Even the Arctic is burning in certain places. Mm -hmm. um, there's a plastic garbage patch in the Pacific that's twice the size of Texas. So... Um, no, there are all these situations. So, what does the what do the genus loci of those places think about that? And what, what obviously, I think they would like us to clean them up or stop causing the destruction. But mm -hmm. um, it's easier said than done. So, I mean, how would you well, comment so, on that kind of thing? Okay, so it's very, very easy to be utterly overwhelmed and then be just be frozen. That was a small thing. It was in my small area. It took me a day to clean, uh, for the pair of us to clean it up and sort it out. And to sing songs, um, sing songs, put the rescue remedy, <clears throat> and just generally bring these elementals and the nature spirits back into a health-bearing place. With a massive, as you say, open mining, I think this is why we get so many uh, weather anomalies and um, why we get volcanoes and this disruption. It is the anger of the gods or it is the anger of the nature spirits. But there is an enormous amount of support too, because technically if you were going to look at this in a purely physical way, the whole planet would have died by now. If it had not been, I would say, from the angelic and the nature realms, upholding and absorbing our immorality or our thoughtlessness. I wonder if they've even had a hand in averting um, nuclear war, which, yes. which could have quite suddenly killed the planet. Yes, many people say that the off-planet races are responsible for that. But, you know, there, there are huge, vast nature spirits that are created when a nuclear power station is built. That are created? Uh, yes. Good ones or bad but, ones? Well, what's good, what's <laughs> yeah, bad, yeah, yeah, they but, are. You know, the, you, yeah. you, you spoke of malevolent uh, nature spirits and, yeah. and, and benevolent ones. So when yes. something like a nuclear power plant or you know, a, a huge open pit mine or something like that is created, do sort of malevolent spirits congregate there and or what? Again, it can be the nature of the behavior of the human beings on the site. Because some could, some, you could say that some of these open mines are needed. You you know, they're that. needed, <laughs> yeah. You could say they're needed at this point in our evolution. Yeah, and they I'll, may be needed I'll, to create things that we don't really need, but, the, but given mm. what we think we need, they're needed. Yeah. I'll give you an example. I went another conversation with the genus loci. I was, um, had to do a, a conference from, uh, about nature spirits, the reality and the responsibility. And I asked the genus loci, where shall I go to get my talk? What do you want me to say? And who was I expecting to go off to an ancient and beautiful woodland? I was taken off to 
an open landfill site. The genus loci said, go to the landfill site, meet the elementals there, learn from the elementals of that landfill site. So getting access to it, I had to connect with the um, organisers of the landfill and I said, I'm an industrial artist, may I please go onto this land? Because I can't say I'm going to go and speak to the elementals, <laughs> sadly. All right. One day we will. So I went into this landfill site, and let's not sweeten this at all. Utter filth. We have the nappies, the plastic, the filth, the black leach water coming out of the hill. We'd had um, storms and rain. The place was, the stench was unbelievable in this place. And I just was there for about two hours meditating on the elementals in this place. And then the trucks came in with the new load. They emptied their load and it emerged like a sort of sleeping goddess. It seemed to mirror all these beautiful Welsh hills surrounding it. And there in the middle of this landfill was this sleeping goddess of all our rubbish, surrounded by black stench leech water. And so my question to the elementals and to this being of all our rubbish was, what do you represent? What do you represent? What is your relationship to humans? And the message and the um, heightened communication that I received was, I represent a chronic epidemic of self-sabotage. Mm. She was sick and she was ill. And I said, how do you feel? Myself lies lamenting on the ground. Raise it. So these deep and profound connections that we can have if we find this stillness. But what was, the re what was redeeming this place? One, it was the nature spirits of the surrounding hills were just sending in what I would call these beams of support for this particular area. So the nature spirits come in and they, they support it. And it was also the morality and the behavior and the manners of the people who worked in that landfill site. Never underestimate the um, attitude of the human being and how powerful that is. All of those men in, on that site one, they were really polite. They had a great sense of humour. The manager, Tony, took me around the whole place and really gave me time explaining what everything was and how it all worked. There was a chivalry there. There was no, I was the sole female and there was no nonsense at all. And also there were some young men there who'd built up this incredible skill, for instance, of winding strawberry nets into these really compact balls so that they would make a small amount of space as possible when they went into the landfill. So it was this attitude of human beings that created a moral sort of morphic field to counteract this result of our chronic self-sabotage in the physical form. So when you say that, it almost makes me feel like the um, human beings working there were kindred spirits uh, of the elementals who were trying mm -hmm. to pour in life into the area, that, that they're just sort of on the same basic wavelength, trying to make the best of a bad situation. Yeah, I mean, they're doing the best they can. There's a sense of humor, and they're, they're doing a good job with 
a bad symptom of our chronic self-sabotage. Yeah. Huh. So, so that's an example. So it's very easy. And you can say, well, that open cast mind is horrendous. But what are the human beings like in there? Are they doing their very best? Uh, <clears throat> and also one has to remember that these really big nature spirits that oversee a huge area, they're out of space and time. They're out of time. They're seeing this, this incident as possibly a, a punctuation in their equilibrium. But it comes to the point how how much can nature bear our um, thoughtlessness? I mean, learning about elementals has much learning about and actually having an experience of them has much more power than moral sermons because we get to have a physical and um, very real response to our thoughtlessness. And for instance, with the uh, experiments we've done contacting tree diseases, summoning and speaking to the diseases themselves, this is extraordinary. For instance, there's the uh, sudden oak death and we have the ash dieback. These are two very, very... Um, pernicious and difficult diseases at the moment. Yeah, we have the emerald ash borer over here, which is basically wiping out all the ash trees. They'll, they'll probably go extinct at the rate things are going. Yeah, ruled by the sun. And the, the, the sun, you know, the rays coming in the sun, they're being deeply distorted by radio waves, deeply distorted by um, the geoengineering and the um, chemtrails. So the wisdom of light, the pure ideal and the idea of the ash tree, that idea that is gating through the sun onto the earth and onto the trees, that um, pure signal is being scrambled, not only by the geoengineering, but also this was one thing that came up very strongly when we spoke to the being of uh, the ash dieback. It is the amount of lying. Lying creates a substance in the um, soul field of the earth, these huge morphic fields of thought forms. If they are lies, they have a profound effect on the health, the physical health of nature. And of course, in the past 20, 30 years, Lies can go around the planet so quickly and they can be believed by a huge amount of people very, very quickly. So they, they create these really solid thought forms. But luckily enough, with the truth media, there's a huge effort, some wonderful sites that are doing their very best to pull apart the mainstream media stories. These thought forms are actually not so heavy now. But all these things have an effect on the health of nature. Um, <clears throat> and something like the sudden oak death, that was similar. That disease spoke about the amount of sorrow, incredible sorrow there is on Earth. One for the endless wars and loss of life and illness, we're so ill. I mean, human beings are so ill. However, these, all of these diseases, although they may have a different vocabulary, the basic answer they all give as to why are you here disease is we fill the space you leave behind. We create the conditions for these elementals, which are the primary force for the disease, to actually exist. Just so let me point of clarification. So you're saying that if there's a lot of lying going on, as there certainly is in the world today, or if there's a lot of sorrow or mm -hmm. trauma of some sort, that can actually take form 
as a disease that might wipe out a species of tree or something like that. It, it sort of funnels or channels into something something of that nature. Into nature, into nature, yeah. yeah. And we asked why, why, and this is the most moving and profound thing is that keeps coming up from these trees is we are doing it for you so that you don't get sick. Interesting. So it's like they're taking on our karma or something. Yes. They're, they're absorbing the, the stuff. Yeah. Like sacrificing because, themselves for our sake. Yeah, the sota, the sacrifice. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. And this comes up again and again. And but doing everything these, is reciprocal and interrelated, obviously. So as the trees die, then our the possibility mm -hmm. of our existence is further jeopardized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the key things is, you know, making uh, a meeting or summoning the guardian at the gate of lies. Guardian at the gate of lies, please be with me always so I can recognize a lie and that I won't speak a lie either. I don't want to take us off beam here, but there's, speaking of lies, it seems like there's an epidemic of, well, there's a whole term fake news, and then there's all these mm -hmm. conspiracy theories and all this stuff being propagated on Facebook and YouTube and so on. I mean, there's a shocking number of people who think the earth is flat. And you can, you know, you can start looking at videos about that and reading websites about that and spend days and weeks and months, uh, you know, uh, on that particular topic, getting more and more brainwashed if that's your proclivity. And, you know, the same thing with the moon landing being faked and all kinds of other things and, and some much more harmful than than these conspiracies. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's something in, in human mentality which seems to be more prevalent these days from my perspective that makes people susceptible to misinformation and uh, it's really dividing societies uh, everything's becoming much more polarized i think as this kind of stuff yeah. propagates yes definitely i'm going to just get a quote here from rudolf steiner which sure about lies which I found, and this really moved me very much. He's talking about our, really, our ancient ancestors, I would say probably pre-Diluvian. But he says, in those ancient times, a lie had infinitely greater power than it has nowadays. If at the present time, everyone who tells a lie were to suffocate as the result, I think the fear of suffocation would be too great to allow people to risk telling lies. For the thought expressed in the word contained a power to give form to the air in the larynx and then suffocate the human. Hmm. You know, there's an interesting thing in, in many of the Vedic stories where... Um, well, firstly, there's a Vedic saying or phrase, which is, um, it's called Ritambara Pragya, which means that level of intellect, which knows only truth. And there are all these stories about sages who function from that level, who are so true to, so true in themselves and so true to their word that whatever they say must come true. And mm -hmm. some, sometimes there are stories where a sage will speak something in anger or something and oops, you know, yeah. it has to come true because he said it. And that's how the whole um, yes. Srimad Bhagavatam came about. Some guy said, you're going to get bitten by a snake in a week. And he couldn't take it back. It was because he could only speak truth. And, and if he said it, it became true. Truth is, subs I mean, speaking words, words are substance. We create substance on these super sensible realms with every word we speak and every thought we think. And everybody can can help us back from the precipice by patrolling our thinking and our speaking and our ability to forgive. And, um, <clears throat> you know, everybody can do that. Now, Susan, I want to make sure that we don't burn up all of our time going off on mm -hmm. this stuff is all very interesting and I don't, I don't really consider it tangential, but you did want <laughs> to talk about chapter five and we, I don't think we've okay. really touched upon it yet. Okay, so I'm going to go through the four elements 
and the uh, elementals of the four elements and because this actually gives the substance and structure of the ether and the astral that I've that I've been talking about so I'm going to start off with the element the mineral element and mineral falls the farthest and the hardest to serve life and I'm going to use the uh, the word gnomes now I so when ask, you say it I, falls the farthest and the hardest you mean it becomes much it becomes more dense and concrete and perhaps entrapped in that concreteness than any of the other elemental yes. forms yes okay yes okay so i'm going to use the word gnomes and i will ask everybody i will implore everybody <laughs> not to think of to, the hobbit <laughs> <laughs> to reboot that word yeah it is simply a word to indicate the um elementals and nature spirits of solid form <clears throat> So what are they made of? We're made of flesh and blood. What's their substance out in these spiritual realms? Their substance is intellect and intelligence. They are the intelligence of form. That's why we see in sort of colloquial art, these beings with great big heads, you know, a truth comes through in, in art. So, and um, they are also a component part of gravity. It's their intelligence that holds gravity, that is part of gravity, and that is holding and setting limits to matter in a particular way. So that's their substance. They also hold the memory of place. So, when you begin to have a relationship with these beings, you can often be taken into the history of a place. You can feel its history in the, in the cycles of time. They're made of what I would call active cleverness. Active cleverness. That's why they are so useful for the adversary forces. So we have ruling will, which is coming down from the hierarchies, the highest idea, the highest imagination. And then we have human will. And elementals don't have an inherent morality. They are taken hold of by that which is stronger and more influential than they are. So, so they when can you be said forces ruling forces, you might mean... Uh, like a despotic government or something? No, 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 I'm talking about the ruling will of the hierarchies. Oh, okay, higher, higher, the, the will of the higher beings. Yeah, the will of the higher, higher beings. Higher intelligences. Yeah. Yes, so that we'll call that the pure ruling will, the law. Okay. If you like, the laws. So they're the humble laws servants of, of that. Yes, but they can be taken hold of by, um, obviously, by the um, adversary forces as well. Adversary forces. So, are you saying that there's some kind of uh, subtle battle going on between the gods and the demons, as as is sometimes depicted in mythology? Yes, definitely. Okay. And this battle's going on in the etheric, right. which is the is the um, the subtle forces just beyond the physical. This is where the real tussle is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I laugh because uh, uh, my former teacher was once asked why these gods and the demons are always depicted as battling one another. And he said, well, if they didn't, the creation would cease to exist. <laughs> yes, because and I would say, where do the elementals live? It's between the, the, the joy of giving and the sorrow of form. Mm. You know they 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 are enchanted. They've dropped this you know this this form, this hardest form. They have to do time in form. Yeah, they're in solitary. And but we can enliven them, and we can allow them to recycle more with our appreciation and our gratitude and our love. We liberate them. We liberate them indeed. Okay. And. So I'll then just move briefly on. So that's so that's it. The, the gnomes, the, the elementals of solid form, they are pure intelligence. That's their substance. 
with the undines and the water beings, their substance is dreaming, a dream, the substance of dreaming and the substance of emotion. Dreaming meaning regular human dreaming or? Well, if you think what a dream is, for instance, they would hover over the seed and dream the plant. I see. So they sort of conceptualize things into existence in a way, or dream things into existence. Dream. Conceptualize too hard. They're much more mobile and conductive than that. Dreaming is, 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 is more mobile. So their substance is dreaming. And in many of the shamanic pra- practices, it's entering the dream of the plant. And this is, this is what we're doing. We're entering the dream, the, uh, the kingdom of the elementals of water, the undines. So that's their substance. And again, they're highly mobile, highly conductive. And it's also emotion. So when we have these great clouds of emotion that are emanating out of our body, this is very much akin to the substance of the undines. And then the sylphs or air spirits, they are the light bearers. They bear the light to the leaves and the fruit. And it's very much um, the shaping and forming of the plant and the fruit, the light, the information and the wisdom on the light. I would just like to interject here that I suspect that you would say that all of this, this whole way of explaining things, is completely compatible with scientific understanding of things such as photosynthesis and, you know, Newton's theories of relativity and any other laws of nature that science has discovered. It's just a different, completely different language or completely different way of explaining it, which actually takes Mm -hmm. into account um, certain things that science hasn't even considered that existing. Exactly. I mean, Rudolf Steiner always said that the, the laboratory table needs to be Treated as an altar. You mean the the periodic table of elements? Yes, oh, the laboratory each, table that a lab, yeah, that a scientist would work yeah. on. I see. Right. 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 Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Each element is a being. Yes. See what 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 we need to do is just take this step farther. As I said, to go from talking about stuff to talking to stuff. Mm-hmm. By knowing that each behind every element there is a being and it is communicable. Yeah. So gold, argon, oxygen, nitrogen, all these different elements, yeah. they, they, have a, an, they have a sort of an in, intrinsic intelligence that is, care, that is specific to them and that mm-hmm. we can think of as a being. Yep. And we can communicate. We just need to learn how to do it and to integrate that with the weights and the measures and um, the categories of science. <laughs> Call me gullible, but it makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is that, I mean, more and more teach um, scientists, I mean, the Bruce Lipston and Greg Braden, they're all followed, you know, deep spiritual paths. They know this and they're bringing it through. And my teachers, my t- both of my teachers are highly um, skilled seers, Dennis Choklet, Je- Dennis Klocek of um, the Rudolf Steiner College in Sacramento. I mean, he's an incredible seer and a true master and also a great scientist as well. They've done the exercises. They've opened their capacities to see into these realms and they're brilliant scientists. Mm. You might want to encourage them to go to the Science and Non-Duality Conference and speak there or you yourself. It's you're probably aware of that conference. It's in not far from Sacramento every October, and a whole bunch of scientists and spiritual people get together and kind of like uh, intercommunicate. This is the way out of the impasse: is is to speak to nature and learn how to do it. This is the whole key. But when, but it's getting to know the components. So we have this com- components, which is intelligence, dreaming emotion we come to the sylphs 
And that is like their substance is wishing and willing. So these have velocity. A wish has a velocity. A will has velocity. I mean, you have just stand up on the rocks and get the west wind coming off the Irish Sea and you can really feel what, you know, the will of the sylphs is. You can feel this um, this component. And then you come to the salamanders or fire spirits and their substance is generative warmth. Not dead warmth, this generative warmth that minimizes the cosmos into a seed. It's taking that high ideal and on the heat in the fire and into the seed. So generative warmth, wishing and willing, emotion, dreaming, and um, acute cleverness, intelligence. These are all substance. And this is what these beings, this is their substance, and this is what they're made of. When you um, yourself listen to science presentations or read science books and things, you know, when you hear, let's say, a, a, you, you might read a book, let's say, about Einstein and all the things he discovered and all that, do you find yourself kind of tr correlating or translating that knowledge, or maybe a better word would be supplementing uh, that supplementing perfect. Yeah. yeah, that knowledge with what what you you know, and I'm sure you mm -hmm. wouldn't find it conflicting or contradicting it. It's just like okay, the, the, if you bring in this dimension as well, it becomes a much richer understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's literally it's completing the circle of life. Yeah, it is. It is going from the physical out into the spirit, spiritual and back again and being inclusive with it. And it's really so important because, as we've said, you know, our main problem here in the world is that we have, you know, we're like sort of guns in the hands of children or something. We've, we've acquired all these powerful technologies, but without the deeper spiritual dimension or on, uh, which could render our technological know-how um, benign and and we could still benefit from it, but without you know all the creating so much harm and damage. Yes, I mean I look at the the five G receivers and I just think, well, it could be pulsing in love. Huh. Well, what do you make of that? Let's take five G as an example. It's a big controversy right now. Um, some people feel it's more um, threatening than climate change. I don't, I don't know about that, but here in my town, there's a lot of fuss about you know how to keep it out um and what would happen if it if it got in, implemented um well the elementals are being you know they're being forced to do time in a form that is inimical to life mm. so in other words 5g uses certain 5g or any technology uses certain laws of nature or elementals mm -hmm. in order to function but it's like they've been enslaved to do something harmful. And, exactly. And they don't like it. <laughs> yeah. But, but somehow or other, we, we can bend them to our will if we are. That's what, I mean, it feels like that. It's, you need to detach them from the intention. That's how, this is what I'm, this is what I sort of wish for and are asking for more and more information from the nature spirit. How do we detach the elementals that are um, enchanted into forms that are inimical to life? How do we detach them from the intentions that are impure? Yeah, well, um, but... When I get an answer, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, please do. But, I mean, it seems to me that certain technologies are always going to be harmful they're not they're never going to be benign um and elementals or no wh whatever the involvement of the elementals they are going to be inimical to life to use a phrase you just used so uh, what happens do do somehow the elementals withdraw their support and such technologies fail or become obsolete or what's the resolution of this stuff We have to rise in consciousness 
enough that the intention can no longer survive. Because we live in, obviously, we live in a world of duality and everything inimical that's made, its opposite has to be made as well. But these solutions rely on us rising in consciousness to be able to access the solutions. Right. All right. So to, let's take another example. So um, genetic engineering um, and companies like Monsanto and so on, what they've been doing with it. So what you're saying is we need to rise to a level of wisdom where we think, well, that's not a good idea, actually. Creating seeds, that, that uh, terminator seeds that can't regenerate uh, so that you have to keep buying them from this company. Why would we want to do that? Uh, so let's get into organic agriculture or permaculture or whatever. So you're just saying let's, if we wise up, then we just will drop these, these harmful technologies and um, use more positive um, alternatives. Yes, because we will access solutions and ideas the lighter and more consciousness conscious we become yeah and again and also it's it's also asking the elementals themselves this is happening what is the solution and it's being open just asking this question of nature what as a human being can i do now i'll, I'll just give an example of one of the strongest uh messages I had from, let's say, the gnomes, the earth elementals or the earth nature spirits. Most of the time when I actually see these beings, I don't see them all the time and I don't want to see them all the time. It's the array of responsibilities that come to you when you are in these heightened states and you experience these beings is extraordinary. So most of the time it has been when I've been in a state of joy, gratitude, beauty. There's only one time that I actually was catapulted into their realm when it was negative. And that's when I went on a walk and I was berating myself for doing something wrong. And I was catapulted into their world and I was shown this expression. <laughs> We create a, this stench. We create the most almighty stench in these subtle realms and a clamor when we berate ourselves and are constantly um, in our argument with ourselves. That is one of the most um, potent negative things that we can send out onto the ether. And there's that one, I think you've interviewed him, that wonderful um, speaker, Matt Kahn. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. He's doing incredible work with teaching people how to clear that out of the system. I remember the first, um, the first interview I ever saw with him, he said, if the whole of humanity put their hand on their heart and said, I love you, and truly meant it, the, the, the disease and the ocean would be healed within seconds. So it's a beautiful idea, but I can see the um, super sensible science of that. Because again and again, the negative elementals are, and the diseases are saying, we fill the space you leave behind. So we have to create a space a super sensible, etheric, spiritual space that has more and more joyful elementals in it. And then these diseases will recede and our, um, our consciousness will flower and we will get more and more gifts of enhanced comprehension on what to do to pull ourselves back from this precipice. Yeah. You know, I think that um, all the solutions obviously exist and there are solutions for every problem that the world faces. And it's just a matter of, as you say, you know, getting attuned to the, the deeper wisdom so that they can come forth. We mm -hmm. might also say it's a matter of deserving 
you know, there's, there's that saying, deserve than desire. Yes. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, if we can increase our deserving ability, then our receiving mm-hmm. ability will be enhanced. And that comes again, the, the self, you know, we do deserve. And by endless berating, we deserve to treat ourselves better as well. Yeah. To add to this deserving. Mm-hmm. A question came in from Yvette in Grimsby, Ontario, Canada. She asks, um, in reference to the ideas of Terence McKenna, who asserted that plants offer hallucinatory experiences and teachings, um, this is related to the ideas of plant medicine of the indigenous people, do you see some plants, plant entities, as being more conducive to being our teachers and contacts, or are all plants equal in this capacity? I guess she's saying, you know, is is corn potentially as as potent a teacher as ayahuasca and the entity that is associated with each plant depending on the it depends on the question i think they are all equal i'll give you an example for instance i had a question with an old yew tree and i asked a very very simple question took myself down into this this yielding, my place in this um, sheath of soul quiet, and said to this tree, who am I? Who am I? Now the yew tree shot, gave me this gift of comprehension of just how ancient a human being can be. You can pick up a tiny stone of or a tiny piece of silica and that silica can take you up into the cosmos and show how it used to be aeriform and how it's come in this aeriform and gifted itself to the earth it's a major part of the earth silica so i think all earth's phenomena all of nature can give us powerful insights depending on what we need to know. Regarding the, um, the, let's say, for instance, the psilocybin or the ayahuasca, I think especially the psilocybin is now proving to help a lot of people with schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. And depression and, and alcoholism and, and all sorts yeah, of Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great gift, this plant, as is cannabis, the, the cannabis plant as well. Um, <clears throat> I've found that... In the past, I have taken the, the psilocybin as, you know, as a young teenager. And I've experienced what it's like to see the elementals when you take a substance like that. And I've also experienced it going through this route as well. With this route, I find it's much more precious because I'm in my own sovereignty and I'm developing these capacities. When you take the psilocybin, it's in charge. The being is completely in charge. <clears throat> and you really need to be prepared, very well prepared, to take something that is going to be in charge of you. I'm not saying it's wrong or it's right or anything. Um, but at the moment, I've, I feel working with the nature spirits through this more sort of laborious or <laughs> more the harder route is giving, for me personally, a, a greater reward. Well, the word prepared, I think, is key. Um, mm. You know, anybody can swallow a substance, regardless mm-hmm. of how full of impurities they may be, how, you know, how, how twisted or stressed or whatever, you know, their, their nervous system is. Um, but if we go the route that you're describing of working out these impurities and untangling these twists and, you know, purifying the system and, and clarifying our faculties, then these, these perceptions and abilities will dawn naturally when the, they're ready to do so, when it's appropriate. Mm-hmm. And you are definitely in your own I am and your own sovereignty. Mm-hmm. Building you, a proper you, foundation. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but they're they're great teacher plant plants. You know they've um, they've changed many people's lives. The psilocybin and for the good. But I do really, uh, in answer to this question, I think every plant has 
a wealth of wisdom to give us. Yeah. <laughs> I took down six pages of notes to, to ask you. I haven't referred to them too much. Um, <laughs> but um, is... No, the, I, go ahead. Was it the thought and the fire spirits you wanted to know? Oh, there's all kinds of things. Um, yeah. I just want to make sure that you feel that, you know, by the time we wrap this up, you have had a chance to say all the things you want to say. And obviously we could go on for four hours or six hours and <laughs> not run out of things to talk about. But I just want to make sure that we... We really hit the most important uh, points. I'd like to just go through um, methods of connecting with them. <clears throat> Drawing a plant is, is a really good way of connecting. Sitting down with a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil and sitting down and drawing a tree. This beautiful sort of merging can happen between the two of you. It's like you're stroking its aura when you are when you're drawing it this is a great way um, always ask permission may i communicate and good manners and also chivalry this word chivalry and it's you know pointing this whole business of pointing and naming and labeling i've seen i felt some of these trees sort of really tense up when they're pointed at so we have to be careful of our manners around them you mean if you're walking through the woods and you say oh that's an oak tree oh that's a maple tree and you're pointing and saying that it it, it, it insults them in some way it can do it can do if that's all you're going to do because you're it's like ticking it's off trivial, a list. it's superficial it's it's like yeah you know you if you're not recognizing the the, the profundity of what it actually is, you're just calling it a name. Yes. Yeah, okay. So here are some questions. <clears throat> uh, also, this, this business of yielding is going into meditation, let's say with a plant or a flower or a beautiful rock or a lake, yielding. And Stana has this beautiful phrase, yielding into beauty brings forth pious devotion to infinity. So you yield yourself into this beautiful plant and this part... Humility comes to mind. Yes, great humility. And observation then becomes this chivalrous participation in its life as well mm. <clears throat> someone named joan sent in uh, a few questions maybe i'll just ask all three and and mm. you can answer them all in one response um she asks do elemental beings look like vibrating light to you or do they have clear outlines can you see emotions and thought forms floating around what sounds from the spiritual world can you hear The sounds, spending time at a waterfall and going down into this no time, the meditation when everything slows right down and the water almost stops. One is surrounded by tones. Yes, I definitely feel those. And it's through those tones that I get really good um, inspiration for my songs. <clears throat> Oh, speaking of your songs, um, we're going to maybe at the end of the interview, what we do and we'll we'll conclude and then we'll we'll add one of your songs in for people to listen to uh, before the final th end of the, the recording. But anyway, good. OK, good. And then her other questions about emotions or um, vi and, and what, what they I look like. See. Yeah. It's very translucent, shimmering light that's winking in and out of physical sight. And um, when they do appear, again, one just is just in this state of such humility and gratitude that these exquisite, dear and beautiful beings have deigned to show themselves to you. It's very, very moving, incredibly moving. And when they show themselves in these shimmering lights, you get a huge sense of, 
the enormous amount of work that they do <clears throat> for our sake. So yes, I see them in different colors, <clears throat> mainly in um, the violet hues. <laughs> I was, uh, I have a friend who sees subtle beings quite routinely. And, you know, if he's in a group of people, sees them ar around each person sort of doing whatever they do. And when I first discovered this, I was in an elevator with him at the San Francisco airport. And, and I said, I've told this so many times, but I'm telling it again. <laughs> I, I, I said, hey, I said, are there any in this elevator? And uh, he kind of just smiled. Then we got out of the elevator and he said, they just said to me, don't point us out to people. If they're meant to see us, they'll see us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think what I'll do to sort of sum up <clears throat> is to um, say a beautiful prayer that came to me. And also, be, maybe animals. even before you do the prayer, there's a practical question here, which is that you give mm -hmm. workshops of some sort, and someone named Maria wants to know how long it takes the average workshop participant to see with her spiritual faculties. So I guess, you know, we want to be, make people aware of what they can do to interact with you and if there are workshops okay. and this and that. Yes. Um, I give a set of workshops, levels or stages one to three. They're called communicating and co-creating with the elemental kingdom. It depends on you and your inner life. What have you done with your own inner life? Um, how much of your past have you processed? How much forgiving have you done? It's the same, same formula. But I would say the nature spirits are doing everything they can to come and meet us at the moment. They're doing everything they can to meet us. And when a group of people come together with the intent to communicate, the whole synergy of the group, most people who come to the workshops I run have an experience with a nature spirit or they find something in them has changed and they are able to see their dilemmas or their difficulties in a very different way from their interactions with the nature spirits. Do you do them over uh, there in person? Do people have to come to Wales or do you do them? Are they online webinars or what? I know I would be very reluctant to work in this, um, in this particular part of the spiritual path online. You have to come and we need to be on the earth. I do them in Amer in um, Britain. Yes, I haven't yet come to America to bring them. And I also teach ritual. Now, of course, there are many of the indigenous people they've brought through over aeons of time, these old and ancient rituals. And these rituals, again, I think have contributed to the fact that we haven't gone over the pre precipice. In, they've held this wisdom for the good of us all, the benefit of us all, and these rituals work. However, with the new elementals coming in, there is a place for new ritual, new rituals to be formed that are these gifts of enhanced comprehension. And it includes eurythmy, which is um, an expressing through movement this is a language the elementals can read is human being in ritual and movement so i teach these uh forms that have come out of the biodynamic research um, institute and these rituals create fountains of well-being where the elementals can come and refresh themselves mm. These are new rituals. Some people are sort of against new rituals, but we're in new times. There's new elementals. We need new ones as well as the old. I'm not, not saying either is better. It's we need as many as possible. And I want to recommend to people, because so many of us think, well, what can we do? I mean, I'm going to recommend this book. It's called Universe of the Human Body with Gaia Touch Body Exercises, and it's by Marco Pajacnik. Now, I have very, some very simple exercises that everybody can do in my book. Send me a link but, to that, and I'll put up a yeah. graphic of it. He, has, he is a very advanced, very skilled seer, 
And he's been working with Gaia and the elementals for many, many years. And he's been asking them, what can we do? And it is full of exercises and rituals you can do as a group or as a human being. And they are, they really work. I can really feel the effect they have on nature when you do them. So I highly recommend those. What, is there any other part of the question I haven't answered? Well, you were going to, no, that's it. But then you were going to do a prayer of some sort, you said. And I, okay. I interrupted you. Okay. So this prayer came to me a while ago. And uh, if anybody would like a copy of this prayer, come to my website and I can send it to you. It is a prayer and petition to the nature spirits and elementals. And we have to, just before I start, we have to remember that we are nature spirits too. We are spirits in nature. And we do need to declare this out in nature so that they know we are kin. I remember I am a spirit of nature too. I respectfully seek admittance to your domain that I may, with grace and reverence, co-create with the beings of your world. In the name of love, I allow you to instruct me and I prepare a place of warm welcome in my heart and mind for your world wisdom to enter my soul. May the responsibility it brings ripen my understanding, deepen my feeling, and guide my willing that I may walk as a true human being through the kingdoms of nature in which we all share the life. Very gift nice. of life. Thank you. Okay. Well, this has been wonderful. I've really enjoyed the whole week of reading your book and now talking to you for a couple of hours. It's uh, been very enriching for me. Um, we want to end with your song, Glittering Cities. Um, is there anything you want to say to introduce the song? Okay. Well, this song, Glittering Cities, this came uh, to me after a period of real calamity and challenge as often uh, true and beautiful inspiration does. It's called Glittering Cities. Uh, I had a profound dream where I was taken to these beautiful and exquisite uh, etheric cities. And in the morning, I woke up and I said, where have I been? And I was reading a book by Rudolf Steiner called The Reappearance of Christ in the Etheric flipped open the page, and there was, this page was all about Shambhala. So I was touching the fringes of Shambhala. And, sh sh and this, explain what Shambhala is for those who need that. It's, one can describe it as an ancient fairy land, an ancient land which has the pure springs and wells of ancient wisdom. And this is something that actually exists in some um, etheric or subtle level? Yes. Yes. It's a place that you can reach. And I was taken there. And these words just came, flowed out afterwards. Nice. Um, and I'm also recording a new album. Uh, and these are songs from the land and the nature spirits. And if anybody would like to see a or hear a preview of the songs... The song it's to go susanraven.com forward slash preview i think i sent you one it's called you we Are the be, Truth." i'll be sending the links to these things i'm putting the links to these things on uh, on your page oh, on, great. on that gap um yeah you know it's interesting to consider i don't mean to take us off track here but uh, it would seem to me maybe you could comment on this that if there are all these beings on subtle levels they must have communities of some sort you know, and even Absolutely. even dwellings of some sort that they mm -hmm. dwell in, maybe. I mean, maybe I'm anthropomorphizing them too much, but they they I think they have they, they get together for meetings or whatever and co collaborate or. <laughs> I think there's schools of elementals. Schools, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Little. And wonder, as do we they procreate? How do they come into existence? 
the higher hierarchies, they're able to create life itself. And this life is then distributed into legions of elemental kingdoms and nature spirits. Hmm. Do you think that's how life originated on the planet? I mean, a lot of times you hear, well, there was this sort of sea and then lightning struck and it created so, somehow life sprang into being. But do you think really it was the hierarchies or the higher intelligences that decided to introduce life at the appropriate time when the planet was yes. habitable enough? Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I bet you they were also, given the vastness of the universe, and I bet you, and according to the ancient traditions, there actually are planets, which are like spiritual planets, where the whole thing is a celestial realm, but it's an entire planet inhabited by celestial beings, subtle beings, higher, higher forms of much more highly evolved life than we have here on this planet. Mm -hmm. Yes, Steiner speaks of the Venus beings and the Mars beings and the Mercury beings, these subtle beings yeah. in their relationship. The Vedic uh, tradition says that the Petris or forefathers live on the moon. And when I first heard that, I thought, well, you know, the moon has the air, how, <laughs> how they live there. But we're again, we're talking about the subtle realms. In we're fact, talking about the subtle realms. Yeah. We're so conditioned with this small, compact seam of reality. <laughs> Yeah. And it is so vast. The minute you can break open this calcified demand to squash everything down into concepts and spreadsheets, <laughs> once you can just soften that up and ask, they're all waiting for an awake and aware and willing humanity to work with them. They have the answers. And when we work in collaboration, we can pull through this. Yeah. I was in a brief conversation the other day with someone who was speculating as to whether life exists elsewhere in the universe and, and all that stuff. And I said, life is, everything is life. I mean, if you really see into the essence of things, you, you realize that the very center of the sun, which we would consider to be completely inhospitable to life, is full of life. It depends Absolutely. On how, you just have to understand what we mean by life full of exalted beings that are fighting their way through chemtrails. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just, it's the conceit of it to think that a chemtrail can scramble the wisdom of the sun. It's trying. Yeah. I don't want to get into the whole chemtrails thing a little bit. No, it's a, it's no, 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 no. But, but there are actually people who are proposing that we geoengineer the climate by putting sulfur dioxide crystals into the atmosphere and iron crystals into the ocean to try to mitigate the, the, the temperature increase that we've caused on the planet and the, the lack of the ab ability of the ocean to absorb, and absorb carbon dioxide. And these things would be such a gamble. I mean, they would really, mm. you know, magnify the problem many fold if we, and again, it's sort of res this sort of arrogance of you know, human uh, inte so, so called intelligence over resorting to nature's intelligence. This, this, this tendency to try to dominate nature rather than attune to it that, that Engineer conceives it, yes. of such so called solutions. Nature, once we show our humility, begin connecting with her, she can mend herself faster than we believe it. Yeah. If we show willing, when the 5G's turned off, when they stop spraying the skies, Gaia and all her ecosystems of nature spirits and elementals will go into overdrive as long as we join with them. <clears throat> nature bats last. I forget who said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh. Okay, great. So thank you, Susan. It's been really a pleasure. And um, now we will <clears throat> let everyone hear that song. So we'll just segue to that song.
metal melt to a beaten gold. 